Well, Muhammad, it's an honor to have you on Della Faith Testimonies. Uh, for the people who may not know you, who maybe have never seen you, never heard of you, could you just introduce yourself for those who are watching on the other side of the screen? Uh, my name is Muhammad Faridi. I'm the president of Iranian Christians International, and I um, serve as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ, trying to get the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the hand of the Persians, Iranians, Afghans, whoever that is seeking the Lord in our country and around it, we'll try, we we'll try to get the gospel to their hands. Amen. Muhammad, we got an, the honor to hear your testimony a couple of weeks ago, and it really blessed us. And so we're really excited uh, for you to share what the Lord has done in your life today for the people who are watching all over the world. Um, let's start with your childhood. Tell us about your life before Jesus, uh, starting with your childhood. Yep. Uh, I was born in city of Tehran in 1984, five years after the revolution of Iran, the Islamic regime took over Iran. And uh, right after that, Iranians and Iraqis, two neighboring Muslim countries, went to war. I was born in the middle of war, uh, and uh, they call our generation the generation of war. My uncle, two of my cousins, they went and joined, and they voluntarily gave their lives for the sake of defending the country, defending Islam. And um, into that type of a religious family that I was born, I was required to fulfill what Islam is asking of me. I tried to uh, do my prayers, fasting, and all of the uh, Islamic Sharia, the Islamic uh, laws, and I was trying to run toward God and get close to Him. And I wanted to be accepted, approved by Him. I wanted to be a good Muslim that is pleasing to Allah. But the more religious I became, the further I felt that I was going away from God. As Iranians, we do speak Farsi, but I had to do my prayers in Arabic. I asked my mom, Mom, uh, the creator of this world, this, the God that has created us in this language, can I pray to him in Farsi instead of Arabic? And my mom said, a good Muslim does not ask question. A good Muslim surrenders, submits to the will of Allah. If you ask too many questions, always leads to doubt, and doubtful Muslims will be burned by Allah in hell. So I was scared of Allah, so I didn't ask any more question, and I surrendered my life to Him. And I did whatever it was required of me. But the more I did these duties of religious duties as a Muslim to pray, to fast, to do my things, go to the mosque, learn the Quran, recite the Quran, try to memorize the Quran, all of that, this was just the beginning of the rituals in, in the sect of Islam that I was coming from. As Shia Muslims, we do uh, mourn ritually for the dead imams, for the son-in-law and the cousin of the Prophet of Islam, and then for his sons. So these people, uh, Muslims believe that these people have a special place with Allah. They're the medium between God and man. So if we honor them, if we, we accept it by them, they would give us favor before Allah in the day of judgment. So we mourn for them, for these dead people. We gather in a shrine, we gather in a mosque, and in the anniversary of their death, uh, there is a eulogy that is recited. There is a eulogy that is go, is has rhymes, it has beats, and when you go there, do you start uh, wailing and crying for these dead imams? They say if you cry for them, for them, if you shed your tears for them, this will give you good deeds, and it will buy you favor in the day of judgment. The imam, the clergy, whoever is at reciting and leading that type of ceremonies, it would provoke the crowd by self-flagellating, beating their chests, beating their, uh, our, our faces to say how sorrowful we are for the death of that person. And as a part of identification with that death, we also mimic, imitate the, 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 the way that they died. For example, the first Imam of uh, the Shia Islam, Imam Ali, was, uh, he died when he was praying to Allah one morning in mosque. And someone comes from the back and hits, hit his head with a sword and kills him. So we imitate his death. We get a sword and we cut our head to imitate, to identify with his death. To all of this ceremonies is to put good deeds in the right side of the scale that we can be, that the good deeds would outweigh 
the bad deeds, that hopefully we have this hope that our good deeds will buy us out of hell of Islam and then uh, Allah will grant us paradise. Mm. I remember when I was growing up doing all of this, going to the ceremonies, every evening I would go to this ceremony and beat myself, beat, uh, beat my chest. We have flags that there are, uh, there's handles with chains on it and you beat your back with them. I remember nine days in a row, nine evenings in a row, I went and joined this ceremony and beat myself to try to bring the judgment that was to come to my body, humiliate my body, bring that punishment to my body in order to escape the judgment that was to come. So I start beating myself so much that on the 10th day, which is this, the, the most important day of the day of Ashura, which is the most important day of this type of mourning, this type of ceremonies, nine days in a row, I beat myself so much that on the 10th day, I was so physically broken. I was so hurt that I couldn't get out of my bed to go beat myself more to self-flagellate, to humiliate my body, bring that punishment to myself, try to escape the judgment Allah has for me. And I felt so ashamed of myself mm. because I couldn't go and continue in it. I said, what type of a Muslim am I that I cannot do the least that is asked of me? And that is how I was trying to be a good Muslim. Of course, this was my, my uh, teenage years of being uh, doing all of this and I trying to get approved by God, get, get closer to Allah. And the more, uh, more of this I did, I, I felt further from Him. It, it, felt, it, it seemed to me that when I was running toward Allah by doing all of this, toward this dead Imams, these people that they have, they're the medium between God and man, as, as much as I was trying to get closer to them, it seemed that they were f running away from me. It was getting further and further from me. Mm. This brought such a uh, such hopelessness and desperation into my um, soul, into my life. Now, and Mohammed, then, before you continue, I know you mentioned teenage years, mm -hmm. but exactly at what age, if you if you remember, mm -hmm. at what age did that start the the self mm -hmm. uh, mutilation or you know? When did that start? I was in middle school and then eventually in high school that uh, we got intensified because now I was um, 15, 16 years old. I could go out on my own and uh, um, side by side of our home and apartment that we lived in the city of Tehran. The guy next door, it was a, a Muslim clergy that held this type of ceremony. So it was very close to our home and I would just go every evening and see uh, this type of, um, and join this type of uh, ceremonies, this uh, mourning ceremonies yeah. and uh, worship of the dead, if you would call it. Wow. And for your parents to see this, for this, for this was them, for them, is there, is this like an honor that their, their children are doing this? Or what was your parents' reactions as it? Was this just a normal thing? My mom was very supportive of this. I was youngest in the family, but I was the most zealot. Every evening, every every time that I could join a mosque, it wasn't like only the Friday the Muslims go to mosque. Every time I could get, I would join the mosque. I would do the uh, gathering or the, um, they call it the, the um, community, the commune uh, prayer that the Muslim have. I would just go, not only just do the prayer, I would serve other Muslim. I would stay to clean the mosque because I just wanted to know who God was and I wanted to be approved by him. I wanted to be accepted by him, mm. to be pleasing to him. And I, and I wanted to know that my eternal life, my eternity is in a good place. So wow. this was my approach toward God and toward Islam. And where did your life go from there? So now your teenage years, you're getting deeper mm -hmm. and and into doing some of these ritual, rituals. Where did it go from there? So I'm, I was going through all of this and um, getting very, very religious. I was listening to many Islamic uh, ceremonies. I would even travel from our city to city of Mashhad, eight hours away, to go to the city of Qom, to other religious cities, to just try to find God. To connect to him and the way you connect to god because the god of islam is impersonal you have to connect to a person that has favor already with him that you connect through him to god and these imams this uh, uh supposedly sinless uh as shia muslim we believe in the uh, uh, in in the blood that you have to have a pure blood in order to connect to the prophet of islam so his son-in-law and supposedly his sons they all have that pure blood. So if you connect to them, they connect you to God. So I would travel to different cities, different shrines, go and try to connect to that person 
in order to be connected to God. And the more I travel, the more I ask questions from the scholars, from the Ayatollahs, from the Islamic clergies about all of the things that was going on with me. I would say to them, for example, this highest scholar that was around, his office was in the shrine of the eighth Imam in the city of Mashhad. I would go to him and I would ask questions from him. And I would say, uh, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I'm trying to do for God and get close to him. But I haven't reached it yet. I haven't earned it yet. And then he would look at me and says, my son, you have to do more. Mm. It, there is so much more to do that you're just getting started. But to me, at those, in those days, I was doing a lot. I was bringing all of this judgment and this punishment to my body, humiliating myself. I was doing all of my fasting and all of my prayers. I was serving in mosque. I was doing all of this to earn God's satisfaction, to come close to Him. And then when I talked to them, because I wasn't getting close, and I was talking to these scholars and they would say, I need to do more. This was really burdening to me. This was really, it wasn't very hopeful. It would actually bring more desperation into my life and more hopelessness into my life. But I just kept pushing and kept pressing to see how much more I can do. For example, I got introduced to this ceremonies of self-flagellating with a sword, cutting yourself, shedding your own blood. And I remember the first time when I knelt in front of an imam, there was a line of people standing for him to strike their heads with sword, with his sword. And then he wiped the blood off of the person that was prior to me. And I started uh, chanting the name of the, uh, the, the first uh, uh, prophet of uh, Shia Islam or the first caliph that, that we call it. His name is Ali. I was chanting his name and he struck my head several times with that sword. And then when he was done, done as I was chanting the name, when, I, when he was done, when I was touched up, when I touched up my head, I looked at my hand, it was chopped hair and blood running down the side of my, my hair. I was trying to shed my own blood and do anything that it takes to be the sacrifice for Allah, to be, the, to be pleasing to Him, that I could come close to Him. Everything I was doing, it was just trying to know that He is happy, He is good. I'm in right standing with God. I have been in ceremonies with people with two inches of blood all over the place. Wow. I walked in the blood of people because that's how we were trying to shed our own blood in order to receive forgiveness, in order to know that God is pleased with us. And I did all of this. I finished high school. It's mandatory to serve in the military service. I was actually glad that I was um, uh, picked. The, uh, the, the government picked picks for you where you're going to serve the next two years. And I was, they uh, assigned me to the Revolutionary Guard of Iran, which is a religious organization. It's a religious um, army that supposedly expo uh, exports Islam outside of Islam and defends the Islamic regime, is defend the Islamic movement, defends the Islamic revolution. And I was picked to be trained by them, to be a part of um, uh, that movement. So um, I went to uh, my boot camp. I was trained, you know, you would think, okay, you go to, into an army to be trained as a soldier, to know how to uh, march correctly, how to stand correctly. That was a part of it, but most of the training was a spiritual. Uh, they took us to the war zone. Um, so the, the war that happened between Iraq and Iran was 1980 to 1988. Now we're talking about uh, 2001, 2002. So, Many years after the war is over, they still try to keep the culture of war and martyrdom and the culture of dying for Islam alive in you. So when I joined the military and I was sent, it's many years after that, but they took us to the war zone between the country of Iran and Iraq, and they showed us what it takes for a good Muslim to lay his life down for the sake of a greater cause. Uh, we had those um, morning ceremonies, this time for the shaheeds, for the martyrs. Because if you die for the sake of Islam in a war, you are a jihadist. You have earned the highest level of fulfilling the sharia of Islam. My uncle was a part of it. I remember how much they honored our family because of the life that my uncle gave for the sake of Islam. So now we're in the war zone. They, we are trying to connect ourselves to these martyrs. And then they have the, uh, there is a graveyard of these martyrs. And of course, now everything has, um, those graves are empty because the bodies are um, spoiled and, 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 and uh, gone away. 
But um, they said that uh, they have to put us in these tombs and these graves, that we know what it takes to be in that as a Muslim, uh, what it takes to reunite your spirit with the spirit of martyrdom. So part of the training was that they put us in those empty tombs and graves, that we can be uh, knowing the cost of living as a, as a soldier of Islam, as a good Muslim. Mm. I remember when the first time I did that, it was at night. It was pitch dark, very quiet. They put us in this uh, deep graves. They put us in there at night. And then if you would hold your hand, you couldn't see it. it was, that's so dark. And then it felt that the walls of this grave is going to fall on you and uh, bury you alive. And this was a part of our training. And then that's that's how they wanted they wanted us to be prepared to know what is the cost. And then that was the part of the training. I was uh, in the Revolutionary Guard for the next two years. I was trying to learn all I can more about Islam. And then uh, while I was there, of course, the sixth pillar of Islam was revealed to me, which is martyrdom, which is jihad, which is uh, fighting for Islam as a good soldier of Islam. And then they said, the only people, according to the Islamic doctrine, according to the Islamic uh, Quran, the only people that the, the heavens is guaranteed to them are the people that they fight and they die in a battle for Islam. And if that happens to you, then Allah will give you that place, will honor you that mm. place. And then you actually become the medium now for 70 members of your family. Wow. Not only you will be saved, but you can be now interceding for 70 members of your family. So that's what I learned from the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard of Iran, and then that was a part of my training. I came back uh, after my military service home, and um, I was uh, going to mosque. I had now new friends, developed new relationship as a soldier, and I was trying to do all of that. But meanwhile, when I was growing up, I had a friend that we grew up together. And then this friend of mine, he had uh, flat feet, so he was medically exempt from military service. When I was in military service, he's three days actually older than me. So uh, off and on, we were in a school together. We hung out together. So now I went to the military service, service for two years, and I came back, and I didn't know what he's doing with his life. So I wanted to reconnect with him. So I called him up one day, and um, I had a motorcycle, went and picked him up. And um, in about 10, 15 minutes of talking to him, I realized the man is tremendously changed. He was very calm, he was very uh, mellow. It just the peace and the light that was coming out of him really bothered me. It was something really unusual, really odd about him that day. And um, I asked him, what has happened to you? What, what is this? There's something wrong about you today. What is going on? And then uh, he said, no, I'm fine, but I, that thing was bothering me. So I asked him, kept asking till he said that he became Christian. And this is happening a few months after the Revolutionary Guard of Iran. And uh, it is in the city of Tehran. And I'm trying to reconnect to an old friend. And then he tells me that he has become Christian. In my Muslim mind, becoming a Christian, it wasn't possible. One of the doctrines of faith in Islam is fate. Everything is predestined. Everything is planned. Everything is a fate. Everything has done by Allah for your life. You just can't break out of this. Mm. And he tells me that he has become Christian. You, you cannot break out of the will of God. It, it just messed up with my mind when he said that, because if you can do that, you're, more, you're stronger than God. Mm. So this idea was very baffling to me. So I kept asking, and he calmly tried to explain that, he heard about Christianity, and uh, he believes it's correct, it's truth, and um, he has seen miracles. He has seen that what God has done for him, his family. We're close friends. I know his family, and uh, he said that my mom was addicted for many years. You know that, he said, and uh, Jesus has healed her addiction and so many things. I mean, none of it was making any sense because Allah has created you a Muslim, you will die a Muslim. You cannot get out of this. So we argued back and forth, back and forth for about two hours. It wasn't getting anywhere. It's just, um, I have ears, but I couldn't hear. Everything was going right over my head and I was just getting upset, mad, emotional. But my friend wasn't losing his temper. He just was very calm. He was just, just describing about the goodness of God and the miracles of Jesus, which none of it made any sense. And this is what he said at the end. 
that changed my life for forever. He said to me, didn't you ask for the reason of change? Did you, don't you want to know what is causing this peace that is in me? He said that Jesus was beaten, he was bruised, he was cut, he was crucified, he gave his life, his blood was shed, and he gave up his life for your sake. And if you believe in that, you will have eternal life. That is the best thing I've ever heard. It was a sword that went to my heart. I was cut to my heart. It was, it was the best thing I've ever heard. It was the moment that the veil was torn off my eyes. I could see that is the truth. Every lie, every deception, every darkness that I was under, that I was trying to do to earn God's satisfaction, the beatings, the cuttings, the shedding of my blood, the bringing of the judgment to my body to humiliate myself, to earn God's satisfaction. I was willing to lay my life down for the sake of Islam to earn God's satisfaction. God's, God, you, 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 you be pleased with me. I'll do anything for everything I was trying to do that wasn't working, that brought more desperation, more hopelessness in my life. He said, it's already finished in the person of Jesus Christ. And it made so much sense. Everything I was trying to do that wasn't working, it was already finished. It was already done in the body and in the person of Jesus Christ. That is what is the best thing. It was just that cold glass of water that I needed. And I fell on my knees and I begged him, what do I need to do? He said, I want you to close your eyes Repent of your sins and ask Jesus to become the Lord of your life, become your savior, to save you out of this situation. I closed my eyes. I said, God, I'm, I'm a sinful person. I'm a wretched man. I cannot do it on my own anymore. Would you forgive my sins? Would you save me out of this? Would you become the Lord of my life? And I opened my eyes. And for the first time, I saw colors. I saw, my God, what is going on? Everything changed. It was a dimension added to life. I couldn't, I could see it now. And that brawl I had with myself all of these years to try to be satisfying to God, to be pleasing to God, to earn God's satisfaction. That, that brawl, that war just came to calm for the first time. I had peace for the first time in 21 years and a half. I was trying to work my way to receive that peace, but it was just given to me mm. when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Man, Muhammad, I wanna take it back a little bit. And uh, before we go into, into your life after, as you were in training and uh, you were going all, through all of these things and even growing up, have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard about Christians or was this the first time that it really, that you really heard somebody or met somebody that had encountered Jesus? Uh, prior to this event, I, I knew about Christianity. I knew about Christ, but um, the Islamic Christ, the Islamic Isa was a failed prophet. I'll explain that. So there are five major supposedly prophet in the Islamic religion, the Islamic doctrine. Four of them has completely failed, and Jesus is one of them. They couldn't finish, fulfill what Allah asked them to do. So Allah needed, had to send Muhammad to complete the failure of the past prophets. So he was a prophet of Islam, but he didn't complete what was he sent for according to Islam. So Muhammad had to come, the self-claimed prophet of Islam, had to come in order to fulfill the failure of these major prophets. He was the best, he was the concealed, uh, the, 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 conce the concealed of the prophet. He has the best doctrinal, most complete thing. So when you have the best, you wouldn't look at the lesser prophets in, the, in, the, in this line. And then 
We knew about Christianity. Well, um, everything we knew, we learned about from the movies, from uh, from the. Uh, it seemed like a big cathedrals and people go inside and uh, there's a Mary's idol that is in the church and people light up candles. So that that's supposed to uh, extent of my knowledge about Christ, mm. about Jesus Christ, about the prophet that was introduced through Islam to us. He wasn't the son of God. He wasn't the savior of the world. He didn't die for the sin of the world. The Islamic Jesus never died, never was crucified. That is in the Quran. He was taken before his crucifixion. Allah supposedly put someone, disguised as someone in his behalf, and uh, the people crucified that person, which is one of the disciples of Jesus, in behalf of Jesus. Allah took Jesus to heaven directly. So he never died. So the Jesus of Islam is not the savior of the world, is a lesser prophet than Muhammad. He's not the son of God. We prayed seven times, 17 times this, this two chapter of the Quran. In our five times prayer, we recited this 17 times that God is not a father who doesn't have a son. Lam yelet ba lam yulet. He's not begot, he's not begotten. So we denied the sonship and the fatherhood of God every day of our lives. And then this Jesus never died on the cross, therefore he was never resur resurrected. So everything um, that we knew about Jesus, it was a wrong information, wrong ideas that we had. And now when my friend talked to me about Jesus, he's talking about someone else. It's not the Jesus of the Quran. It's not the Jesus of Islam. It's the savior of the world, the person that has come, laid his life down for our sake. It is, it's just amazing. Mm. Now, th this is a very extremely powerful revelation. And uh, for you in this time, this can also be a, a very deep problem. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. I mean, you have family who are mm -hmm. devout Muslims, mm -hmm. friends, you were in the army, you were trained for this. Mm -hmm. And now you're putting your trust in Jesus. You're believing in what your mm -hmm. friend is saying. What did what did your life look like after that? Even the even the days right after. Mm -hmm. So after this conversation, and after uh, if you would call it my conversion, um, these are terminologies now I understand or I use. But that moment when I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It wasn't intellectual. It wasn't like some uh, uh, theor theoretical talk point. Now I'm convinced that, oh, you gave me good evidence. No, it, the, 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 he entered another dimension into my life that it wasn't, it was, I didn't believe him with my head. I believed it with my heart. Hmm. After this moment, when I could see colors, this, the, the peace that entered my life. I was so excited because I just knew this is the right thing. This is the truth. I may not been able to explain it yet, but I knew it is the truth. So I went home and this conversation was over. I went home and uh, of course my mind kicked in. I was thinking to myself, so if Jesus is truth and he has died for my sin or the sin of the world, why nobody has told us this yet? This was the crisis I had to deal with. I also, the other thought was, so every person that my life that I'm looking up to, that I believe their words, my mom, my dad, my Islamic clergy, the Ayatollahs, the scholars, everyone that talks about Islam, so they, they are lying or they're deceived. Everything we believe as a community, as a society, they're all a lie because if Jesus is truth, everything has to be a lie. You cannot have two different kind of truth. Islam is telling the truth, Jesus is telling the truth and everything else. That was the crisis that I had to deal with. So I went on this journey to find out before I telling, announcing my uh, salvation, my uh, encounter with God and my encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I do that, I went on the journey to make sure it is true, it's proven. And uh, so the first place, of course, you have to go, it's the church. I had so many bad ideas, wrong ideas about what church or church service looks like. And then uh, when, we, when the first time we went to a church, this is in 2006, I've never stepped a foot in a church. Um, when a Muslim 
shakes hand or hugs a Christian, they go and shower after that because they have come into the contact with an unclean element. There's no difference if you touch urine, if you touch blood, if you touch, these are unclean objects. And if you talk, touch a Christian or a Jew, doesn't matter, you have, you have come into contact. So you have to do proper washing ceremony to get rid of this filth. So now I have converted to Christianity now for the first time in my life, I'm going to a church. So I was very uncomfortable. And I had so many wrong ideas, as I, as I said, um, what church looks like. Never been to, I, all, all I knew about church was coming from movies or something like that. And we're going to a church. So my friend uh, who led me to Christ, his aunt came to know the Lord through a pastor of that church, one of those churches in the city of Tehran, which is a taxi driver. So we had some contact into the church because they do not allow Muslims to visit church as they do not allow, you know, because the churches, it, this is a complicated situation. The Armenians and the Syrians run the churches. It has to be, the service has to be in those languages. It's not open to public or Muslims. So, but we had contacts. We're going inside. It's 9, 9.30 a.m. The church services start at 10.30 a.m. I'm visiting the church for the first time. I go inside the church. After my friend makes the contact, clears with the security, we go to the church. And this church has a beautiful oval-shaped wooden gate to the sanctuary. As soon as I step inside the sanctuary, there is nothing to describe the experience. In my limited English, I try to explain it. It was like a cloud of God's love that came and just gave me a hug. Well, I had an encounter with God. I just was embraced by God. God gave me a hug that day, and it was so fulfilling. It was so amazingly completing. It was, I was just in His presence. I didn't need oxygen. I didn't need, I didn't need nothing. I was just completed in that moment. It was a cloud of God's mercy and love that grabbed me. And in that moment, inside myself, two times I heard, your home, your home. And this was the most amazing thing that happened. And just nothing mattered. Nothing mattered. There was no thoughts. There was no need. There was no lack. It was absolute, pure completeness that I was in. As I was in this moment, I saw people were coming and sitting in the pew of the church. I sat there enjoying the moment of fellowshipping with God, something that I was trying to earn by religion, never came close to it. Now it was being given to me freely, and I knew I was in the right place. The church service starts. They had guitars and pianos, and they were singing songs, clapping hands. It was very strange. The church, the church service was very, very strange. As Muslims, when we gathered, we yelled and wailed and cried, and we mourned, we beat ourselves, we cut ourselves. And now I was seeing these people worshiping with songs, they're clapping hands, they are playing piano, playing music, some people even dancing. Everything that was missing in Islam, that we were trying to reach to that, hope for it, that was missing. It was already in Christianity. Hmm. These people were singing that you were resurrected for our sake. They had a hope that we didn't have. Every Islamic imam, prophet, everyone that came died, stayed dead, and then they built the shrines to them. But there, the Christians, they had somebody that died, but even death couldn't hold him. He didn't have a grave. He was resurrected. So they had a hope that was missing in the Islamic world. And I was just wa watching all of this going around me. And then after the church service, the Christians smiling at me, shaking my hand. And I'm like, why are these people so nice? It felt to me that I've been set up. Something is wrong. These people are way too nice. I have never felt their love. When I went to mosque for hundreds and thousands of times that I have went to mosque. I never look at Muslim that could smile and have what they, what the Christians have. What is going on? Maybe because I'm a visitor, because I'm, I'm sticking out like a, uh, a sore thumb. And what, so we go down the stairs, everything. I'm just carefully watching everything. 
This is my first visit in a church. And then my friend takes me down the stairs, which they had the tea and the coffee and the cookies. And then there was the library of the, uh, the church. And he buys me a New Testament. It's called the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then and he told me, if you, he, he gives me this uh, book and he tells me, this is the living word of God. If you read this thing, it will change your life. God will speak to you. You know, everything is a strange living word of God written for me. But I'm, I'm in crisis. I need to resolve this. So I take the book home and I start reading it. Turn the page. It's, it's the book of Matthew. I start reading Matthew. I start Mark, Luke, John. I go back, read again. In one week, I could not put the book down. Hmm. I read through the four gospel five times each. I cannot put the book down. The more I read it, the more it speaks to me. I, I, I can give you plenty of examples. The Sermon of the Mount exposes everything as a Muslim, hypocritical behavior of a Muslim I was, that I was fasting to show it to the people. Mm. I was praying in public. I was paying alms in public. Everything I was trying to do as a Muslim, Jesus was speaking against it, that you're not doing it unto God, you're doing it unto man, and oh. you're earning your reward. And then it comes to this verse in chapter 11, come to me who all labor, Verse 28, 29, 30. Come to me who all labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I looked at the book. I was done. I said, how do you know? I was laboring. I, was he I had heavy laden. I mean, I was speaking to the book. What is this? And then the words of my friend came to my mind, that this book is written to me. I really... This is not some statements. This is really thought. I really thought to myself, somebody has been walking around all of these years and is studying my life and writing this particular book only for me. I said, somebody is setting me up. As I've been manipulating. It must be those evil Jews. It's this cannot, you cannot write a book that could speak to me so accurately, explaining my what I was going through and what I need to resolve my situation. So next, I'm, I thought I'm going to go to the church next week and I'm going to expose my friend and I'm going to expose this. So everybody that had one of those books that says the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, I asked them, can I sh look at your books? And they say, yeah, sure. The Christians were nice and said, yes. So I would compare it to my book and I'm like, this is the same. Is this book talk to you? And then they would say, yeah. It talks to me. But the passages, the verses that talks to them, it was different than, the, than mine. I'm like, what kind of a book is this that talks to you? And then um, I said, maybe I need to go some other place, separated from this friend. I just need to go some other place. And maybe he has told these Christians to be nice to me. I need to go some other place. So I found another church in the city of Tehran, some other place across from this one. And then that day I went to church. This time um, I snuck in, went in, sat in the front of the church and um, carefully watching everything. It's about 20, 25 people in the church and uh, I'm investigating everything. And then this time the pastor said, um, I want Mr. Ali to come and share his testimony today. I said, Ali, wow, there's another Muslim convert. Because at this time in this journey, the first Christian I know is my friend Rasul, who led me to the Lord, second is me. Now I said, oh, there's another one. Number three exists. So Ali, because, because of her name, you can uh, easily differentiate. Ali comes up the stage. Ali says uh, he had a cloth around his neck. He opens that, and he has a big hole in his throat. And he said, I was diagnosed with advanced throat cancer. Doctors gave me up. They said, I, we cannot do anything for you. Nothing will work. You have a few months to die. You can go and spend it with your family. And he said, Ali said that I spent all of the money with the doctors. Nothing happened. I went to the shrines. I went to the imams, to the Islamic scholars. I tried to receive healing from the, the, the Islamic way, and nothing was working. I was so desperate going home one day. I saw the cross over this building. I came inside, and there was a bunch of people. I assumed they are Christians. I told him, um, I'm dying of the sickness. I've tried everything. I've tried it with the doctors. I've tried it with uh, the imams of the Islamic religion, with the shrines. I've spent everything. Nothing is working. Can I give your God a try? 
and as Christians gather around him, put their hand on this man as, as they are praying, he sees an open vision. There is a hand with a print of nail touch his throat. The man goes home. He said, I wasn't dying anymore. I felt a lot better. I was getting stronger. This hole was to skip my throat. They put water or food in it. And now I don't even need that. So I go to the doctor. Doctor runs some checks and they, they said, the man says, I don't know what has happened. This is a miracle. You're healed. We don't know what happened. Ali said, but I knew what happened. I remember the hand with a print of nail touching my throat. I'm sitting there listening to this man's testimony. I said, I've read that in my Bible. The first person came to my mind was the woman with the issue of blood. She spent everything with the doctors. She went everywhere. She couldn't get healed. But as soon as she touched the hem of the garment of Jesus, she received healing. She was completely healed. I said, this is not a theory. It actually happens today. The living word. Everything, it's just like all of my doubts, everything was demolished after that testimony. That day, the church had a wooden cross. After the church service was over, I went to the cross and knelt in front of it. And I said, God, I'm, I'm sorry doubting you. And I said, Jesus, you're true. You're the one that never changes. You prove your word. I'm not going to doubt you anymore. And if, it, and if this is, came out of my mouth, I said, if it takes for me to die, I will die for your sake. As soon as this came out of my mouth, I heard the Lord say, I have died that you may live. Mm. There is no more dying. And after that, I just was ready to do anything for him. So, so I was, um, after all of this, I went home and um, I was just having a good time, fellowshipping with Jesus, reading my Bible. I was home one day, one evening, actually. Um, I had the uh, lights turned off in my home, in my room. And I was praying uh, to Jesus and I just had a great time, just was glad about all of this. And um, my dad came to my room and he said, what are you doing? I said, um, nothing. He said, no, what are you doing? I said, they were very suspicious because I wasn't attending mosque anymore for this few months that I, have, uh, I was converted to Christianity. I wasn't the same person. I was just minding my business. I wasn't going to mosque. I wasn't watching the Islamic ser sermons after my prayers in the evening. So they were already suspicious, but they didn't know what was going on. So uh, pretty much that my, my dad caught me doing something strange in home, in our home. And then he started questioning me. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying. And then uh, at first I said, I'm doing nothing. And then he said, no, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying. But the way that I was praying, it wasn't the typical Muslim prayer facing Mecca in my prayer rock with a piece of rock in front of me that I was bowing down to it and all that. And he was a very educated man. Um, he asked me, who are you praying to? Because it wasn't typical for him, you know, and I said, um, Dad, I'm praying to Jesus. And then when I said that, he, um, we had a picture of the Prophet of Islam in our home, and he pointed to the picture and he said, why not to Muhammad? I should have stopped then and there and not say anything more, but I said, Dad, Muhammad is dead. How can a dead man hear your prayer? In my mind, I was logically answering that. But when I said that, he, re he got really upset. You could see flames coming off of his shoulders. I mean, it, I mean, he ran toward me, strong man. I was lifted up off the floor and cornered, and he started beating me, and I pulled away and ran away from home. You could say I was kicked out of our home, or I ran for my life. Either one is accepted. So I ran away from home and um, for many nights in the beginning, I slept in people's doorsteps or fo uh, rooftops. And I was getting beaten by cockroaches and so many problems. And um, I was just got uh, tired of it. And uh, I called my friend and I said, hey, uh, my dad has heard about my conversion. He wasn't very happy. Uh, happy. Um, I've been kicked out. You put me in this trouble. Uh, can you help? And he said, oh, come to our home. You know, in the beginning, my family was like that, but now things have changed. So come to our home. So I went to their home. And uh, when I went to Rasul's home, the friend that led me to the Lord, him, his sister, and both of the parents, they all converted to Christianity. So that was my introduction to the uh, underground church. Because prior to this time, I was thinking there's only three ex-Muslims. I'm number two, and uh, Ali in the church was number three. Now, 
the whole family is converted to Christianity. And then because the whole family has converted, the, the, the house was a church. It was a house church. Now there were other people that they directly or indirectly evangelized, and those people were coming. So it was a lot of us. And then I realized there was other people in other cities. And it just was when my home abandoned me, when my biological parents abandoned me, abandoned me for, for the sake of Christ, God already had another house, another place, another family that loved me much better than my own family. So I was received by them. And then um, during the four months that I was out of our home, um, I was just loving it, spending time in the underground church with those believers that they were going through the similar situations. But we didn't mind it because we found truth. Mm. We found the best thing that could happen to a human being. Nothing really mattered. We just spent time in the Word of God, in the fellowship of the brethren. We go out and evangelize and do other things. And I just was loving this, um, this moment of my life. And then after about four months, my mom convinced my dad that uh, I've been misled. I've been, uh, maybe I'm young or something like that, that can be corrected. Talk my dad into uh, bringing me back home that if they, they need to give me another chance. So um, they kind of carefully approached the matter and I went home, but my mom really didn't believe what my dad told her because that son of her that loved Islam and was in the mosque, was very active, was very religious, can never betray Islam, can never betray the family legacy of the family of martyrs. I mean, I, it was very hard for my mom to believe what my dad told her. So my mom talked my dad into bringing him back home. I went home and they kind of asked questions carefully where I was standing. But when I was out of our home, spending time with those believers, I was being marinated in the Word of God. I was just knowing God much better, being more convinced that I'm on the right path. I did the right thing. This is the truth. In the beginning of going back, they were trying to speak to me that, oh, um, my son, you know, maybe you misunderstood it and Islam is such a beautiful thing. And they were trying to, they call it a revert, reverting me back to Islam. And I was like, what are you guys talking about? If anybody needs to convert is you. If anybody is misunderstood anything, it's you. So this discussion went from a civil discussion to mocking, to manipulating, and then this relationship was completely separated. So I was home, but I wasn't. I was a Faridi as a part of the family, but I wasn't. Whenever we had relatives or family members coming over, they would just send me out. They just said, they just find something for me to do to go away because I brought so much shame to our family. Hmm. They didn't want me to talk to any of the relatives. They, did, they were trying to conceal me, to hide me, not to talk to anyone about it. And I really didn't mind it. It just didn't matter. I found the matter. I knew what mattered. This didn't matter at all. I was free. And I lived like that. And um, of course, the financial support of the, my dad was cut. So I had to go work. I worked as a taxi driver in the city of Tehran. I would put my New Testament on the dashboard. And whoever, whatever passenger was interested to know what that illegal book is and says, because the gospel, the gospel is illegal, the Bible is illegal in Iran. So they was... Many of them, they were curious about what is that book, what it says. And so I, would, I, I got a chance to share, um, God knows, with how many people, hundreds, maybe thousands of people I shared the gospel with. Living my life like that and traveling in, in uh, different cities in the underground church. And then um, one day, um, the owner of the agency, the taxi agency, pulled me aside and said, um, intelligence agency of Iran is asked, has asked him about me and my activities. I evangelized his son actually one evening and gave him a Bible. And he said, whatever you're doing has caused tremendous problem for us. It's gonna cause tremendous problem for you. And if the government of Iran is, uh, gets his hand on you, not only they're gonna hurt you, they're gonna hurt your family. Mm. And I cannot let, uh, let you to do this around here anymore. I'll let you go. He fired me. I was afraid. I was afraid for my life. I was afraid more for my family's life, you know, they were a bunch of Muslims. I already were causing a lot of troubles for them. And I just didn't want to cause any more problems. And Jesus says, when they trouble you in one city, just go to another. 
And I wasn't, when I wanted to do that, I wanted to go to another city. But the problem was that when I called those uh, church members that I could trust to flee Tehran to those cities, when I called them, they told me that um, their, their house churches have been attacked. Mm. And many of the believers are missing. They've been uh, in jail, so please don't come around. They told me, please don't come around here. We already have troubles. And that time, uh, that's when I decided to leave Iran completely. Mohammed, how long have you been faithfully walking with Jesus now? It has been 17 years since the day uh, I have um, accepted Jesus, my Lord and Savior. I wish I could say I've been walking with him faithfully, but I always kept a relationship and I was trying to know who he is and what he wants to do with my life and trying to be um, faithful to his call and the relationship that I have with him. It's been 17 years now. Wow. Talk to us about uh, these last 17 years. And I would love it if you could also give us some insight into your relationship with your parents. You know, was that ever uh, resolved? Did they ever come to know Jesus? Mm -hmm. After um, leaving Iran and um, receiving a little more of a wisdom from the Lord in regard to my family and um, trying to reconcile with him, um, my parents, they haven't. Uh, my dad has died about nine years ago. I talked to him about the Lord. I don't know if he accepted or not, but my mom hasn't. And um, the relationship was very awkward, if you could put a good word for it. It was um, this this two world has been separated, really. We try to bring it together, build bridges. We try to keep it civil. And um, this is how I put it. If you don't, if you don't speak in the matter of faith, God, religions, if you keep it a very shallow relationship, I think it, it, it is possible. But other than that, it just, they don't, this, this two worldviews, this two world, they don't match. And I try to um, help loving them respectfully, honoring them, but the conversation comes up. And um, to them, I was just a traitor. I was just a misguided person. I didn't do the right thing by converting. And my mom, after 17 years, she still, hoping and praying that I convert, revert back to Islam mm. and bring my wife and be a good son once again. But uh, when I read the word of Jesus, if I love my mother and father more than him, I'm not worthy of him. So that is um, what has been going on this past 17 years in that relationship. But I believe God loves them more than me. He has sent his son for their sake. There are some good news in regard to my family. And uh, I cannot openly share that, but uh, some of them have to come to faith. So the relationship has been restored. But I still believe uh, for my mom that one day the veil of deception of Islam has been tore off her eyes too, her mind too. Hmm. Now, Mohammed, when, when your friend first evangelized to you, you know, he shared a lot of testimony mm -hmm. of what God had done in his life, what Jesus had done in his life. Mm -hmm. In these last years of you walking with Jesus, what has he done in your life? What have you seen? What is the transformation that you've experienced? And you've touched on it a little bit, obviously, but it just in a nutshell, now looking back, what has Jesus done in your life? The most important the Lord has done for me, of course, saving me from the pit of hell, from the kingdom of darkness, rescuing me out of the deception of Islam. That's the biggest thing he has done for me. and. Uh, I would say if he would do, this is a silly thing, so th silly thing to say, if, if he would do nothing else for me, just getting me out of that darkness of Islam, translating me to the kingdom of his beloved son, to the kingdom that I, can, that I could know God, that I could have a relationship with God, that I have the confidence that God is pleased with me because of the work of Christ on the, on, on the cross. If he, don't, if he doesn't do anything else, I think I have enough reason to love on him and be thankful. He has done a lot more than that. And God has moved through my life and touched a lot of lives because of it, because of the change, because of the change and the transformation that he has brought into my life. So um, now I know he's the best thing that you could offer anyone. So through me, 
through the uh, ministry and the calling that is on my life. He has touched a lot of lives. A lot of Iranians, Afghans have come to faith in Christ. We have introduced God to them and we have told them what Jesus has done for them. So I've seen a lot of miracles. I've seen people getting healed, delivered. I've seen amazing healing testimonies of people that had no hope, no answer. Nobody could do anything for them but Jesus. Because God has touched and transformed my life, now I can offer that to others, that this, this could tremendously change you, your circumstances, and it's bringing hope to them. Mm. So, Well, I mean, who is Jesus to you? Praise the Lord. He's everything. Jesus is my King, my Lord. He's my brother. He's my God. He's my friend. He's my Savior. He's my everything. He's the love of my life. He's my protector. He's my hope. He's my future. He's my everything. For those who are watching, Mohammed, who have friends, who have family members, who are Muslim, who worship Allah, who are in that same place where you were maybe, you know, seeking to satisfy him you know what is a word of encouragement that you can give to those who are watching who have family members who have friends and they want to share the gospel they want to be there with them they want them to be saved um what is a word of encouragement that you can give them as they uh pray for them and as they seek that so if somebody has friends or family members or co-workers that they know that they're muslims one one good thing uh, generally speaking about Muslims, that they, they at least are seeking God and uh, they want to be pleasing to God. They want to perform for a God. So that is a good thing, but um, they need to be exposed to light. They need to be brought in. I can give you varieties of ways that Muslims come to Christ. One of them is when they get invited to a house of a Christian, when they see the relationship respectful relationship with parents, husband and wife, uh, father and their kids, when they see that type of relationship as believers, as Christians, that's exposing them to light. That is the things that we take for granted, the presence of God that is in the life of a Christian that we take as sometimes as believers as for granted. Muslims don't have that. So you can pray for them that they receive the presence of God right there. You can lay their hand on them boldly. They're open to prayer. M many of them, most of the time, Muslims are open when you ask them if there's anything you can pray for them. Pray for them boldly. Pray in the name of the Lord Jesus and let them receive the touch of heaven. Let, them, let, let God flow through you to touch their lives. Take them to a church with you. That is another very, because there's so many ideas, wrong ideas that they have, mm. that when you take them to a church, when they sit in a pew of a church, on a, on a, when they see the worship, God speaks to them. What Muslims don't like is an intimidated Christian, a wimpy type of a Christian that constantly worrying about offense. offense. It, Muslims are really bold about their faith even though it's very wrong, but they're bold about it. They have convictions. So a Christian that has convictions is bold. It's a very good vessel in the hand of God to approach Muslims. So prayers, taking them to your home. But at the end of the day, you have to share the gospel. You have to tell them what God has done for him. Because Muhammad has done nothing. Allah has not done nothing for him. But Jesus has done something personally for them. And you need to tell them that. Mohammed, thank you so much for, for sharing and giving us so much insight into what God has done in your life. Uh, do you have any last words that you would like to share with those who are watching right now? So I wrote this book called Forsaking My Father's Religion. It is available. This is a trailer of my testimony. Uh, some, some of the things that I haven't shared on this uh, particular uh, time, it's in this book. And uh, they can get this book for free. It's a gift from us. Iranians love to t love gifts. Persians love to give gifts to people. This is going to be our gift to the viewers, to the people that are going to watch or listen to this uh, program. And uh, it's available for free on our website. And there are nothing attached to it. It's just a free gift from us to you to for watching this and saying thank you.
they can go to iranchristians.org, iranchristians.org, and uh, there's a tab for a free book, and then we'll send that to them for free. Lastly, Mohammed, could you just pray for those who are watching right now on the other side of the screen? I'll be glad to pray for them. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, let the people that are watching this program that have a touch from heaven to feel and receive and experience your presence, let them have an encounter with you no matter where they go, no matter what they do. Father, I ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, you touch their lives. You give them that encounter that they cannot get away from you. That would be the hook in their jaws to, fo to follow and to fulfill what you have for them, the purposes that you have for them. I love you and honor you in Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen.